good day to you and welcome to the program. It is a beautiful autumn day. The sun is shining and the birds are singing. The horses and the cattle are just so happy and I'm happy to be with you. I want to encourage you now to sit back and take that cup of tea, that mug of coffee, call your family, your children and sit down and listen to the Word of God. You know, the Word of God is so important. It's like, it's like the, the balm of Gilead, like that ointment, you know, it just comes over you. You might have a few grazers. In South Africa, we call them roasties, maybe the skin off your knees from playing rugby off your elbows. Well, the balm of Gilead is going to soothe them. You say, well, you don't play rugby anymore. No, but maybe somebody's been ugly to you at work. Maybe somebody at school has given you a hard time. Maybe you're just feeling desperate. Well, I want to tell you today, you need to make some serious choices. And what does that mean? Well, who are you serving? Are you serving man or are you serving God? And I'm talking particularly today to students. You see, you can't hunt with the hounds and the next day run with the hares. Either you're hunting or you're running, but you can't do both. And that is where the problem comes. And that is where depression and fear come from. One day you're in the pub and you are drinking it up and you're telling filthy stories and listening to rubbish. And the next day you're in church and you're repenting. You can't live like that. You've either got to be ice cold or red hot. Who said that? Jesus said that. In Revelation chapter 3, and verse 16, he says, I would rather you be cold than lukewarm. But if you are lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now, I, I don't apologize. Those are very strong words, but it's in the Bible and you can read it. So you need to make a choice. And I'm asking you today, who are you choosing to walk with? Now, we'll start off with the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 10 and I'm reading verse 12 out of the New King James Version. And now, Israel, okay, you can put your name there. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? Good question. This is what the Lord our God requires of us. To fear the Lord. That's, that's to treat God with reverence. To fear the Lord your God to walk in all his ways, okay, not some of the time, all the time, and most of all, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You know, I've said this a hundred times, people don't have to like you, but they must respect you. And you, and you know, I've told you the story about the young girl that came home from a godly home, Mom and dad, Christians, she was a Christian, and she came home to tell her mother and father that she's going to get married. Well, straight away, dad wasn't too happy because the, the suitor had not come to ask permission. And she said, but he's not a Christian. They were shocked. They said, well, how can you even contemplate that? In fact, he was a, a rabid communist. Now, communists do not believe in God. They say they are atheists. You and I know there's no such thing. How can you do that to us? She said, Dad, Mom, tears running down her face. He's the first man that I've ever met in my life who believes 100% in what he's doing. And that's why she did it. I want to say to you that people are looking today for men and women who will be upstanding for God in season and out of season. That's right, in church and out of church. In a nightclub and out of a nightclub. You shouldn't even be going to that nightclub, by the way. You know, a man wrote me a letter a week ago because I spoke about this type of thing. And he said, I never knew. He said, thank you very much for giving me a gauge. I said, when you go to any place, whether it be a party, whether it be an occasion, You've got to ask yourself a question. If Jesus came with me today, 
would he be embarrassed to be here or not? And if the, question, if the answer is he would be embarrassed to see what you're looking at, better you leave there now because you also will be in serious trouble. We need to make choices today. You see, we've got to obey the statutes of God and the commandments of God. It's no good just saying, I love God. I want to say to you, a man, I won't use his name because I don't do that, who was one of the most prominent men in American television years ago. He was caught for fraud, and he also had an affair with a woman, and he was sent to jail. And while he was in jail, his wife divorced him, and his family basically left him. And they asked him a question. Why did you do it? He said, you know, I always loved God, but I never feared God. See? And maybe one or two of you that I'm speaking to now, you say you love Jesus, but you don't fear him. I want to tell you that the God that we serve is a holy and a righteous God. Okay? Holiness is the end product of obedience. So when you are an obedient person, an obedient Christian, you are a holy person automatically. So an obedient person will not sleep with someone who's not his wife or her husband. Why? Because that is fornication. And a fornicator has got no chance in heaven. See, I'm wearing a ring on my finger. There it is. The camera's picking it up there. This ring tells me that I'm married to one lady. Her name is Jill, my wife. And she is the only person that I will have any intimate relationship with. No one else. Why? Because God said so. That is obedience. That is holiness. And that is what this book has said. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. And then we go to Joshua, the book of Joshua, chapter 24 and verse 15, where Joshua says, who are you going to serve today? Are you going to serve the gods of your fathers in the desert? Remember, they all died in the desert, every single one of that generation that came out of Egypt, except Joshua and Caleb, two men. The rest all died because of disobedience and rebelliousness and unbelief, okay? Two men. Joshua said, are you going to serve the gods of your fathers in the wilderness in Egypt? Or are you going to serve the gods of Edom? He said, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Beautiful scripture. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You know, my oldest son on his wedding day, I was so proud of him. He got up at the table at the reception. It was a big wedding. It was a beautiful wedding. And he stood up. He was a young man. He got married. I think he was only 24. And he turned around and he used that very scripture. Joshua 24, 15. He says, as for me and my house, his house then <laughs> consisted of one wife that he just married. We will serve the Lord. And to this day, he is still serving the Lord. We need to make a choice today. Who are you serving? Are you serving the God of the Amorites? Are you serving the God of your forefathers? Or are you serving the Lord Jesus Christ? You need to make that decision today. I remember that beautiful story of Corrie ten Boom. That Dutch lady who um, was an incredible ambassador for Christ, an evangelist. She tells a story that when the Gestapo, the Nazis, came to that little jeweler shop in Harlem, in Holland, and arrested her sister, Betsy, herself, and their old dad, who was very old at that time. And they put them in the back of a truck, and they took them downtown to the Gestapo office. And the old man, when they brought him in to uh, question him, they said, you are an old man. We don't want to send you to the, the um, concentration camp. We're going to give you a chance. If you promise us that you 
will never hide another Jew in your jeweler shop. We'll let you go home in peace and you can just die in peace. What do you say about that? Well, he made a choice, didn't he? He said to them, when you, if you release me, when I go home, the first Jew <laughs> that comes to my house for help, I will, I will hide him. And the Gestapo officer said, take him away. That old man died within a couple of weeks. He made a choice. And his choice was to obey the statutes of God. When we start doing things in our own selfish way, this brings death upon us. Like the man who walked out of the courthouse, this is apparently true, he had just been divorced from his wife, his sixth wife, number six. And when he walked down the steps, somebody was there and said, and how did it go? He said, you know, she tried so hard to make me happy. Wife number six, how arrogant and how blind can a person be? Six wives, not one of them could make him happy. He was so caught up by himself. I want to tell you, your biggest enemy is not the devil. Your biggest enemy is yourself. And when you die to self, then you start to live. It's a paradox. If you want to live, you have to die. Jesus says, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it bears much grain, much fruit. You'll find that in John chapter 12 and verse 24. We need to make a choice. Are we going to serve ourselves or are we going to serve God? If you want eternal life, if you want joy and peace and purpose, serve God. You know, I've told you, my dear friends, many times, I only have one regret in life, only one. And that is that it took me 32 years to wake up and to realize if I want to live, I have to die. I have to die to my own desires, my own selfishness, my own choices, and I have to start living for God and for His choices over my life. And then what happened? Life in abundance. John 10, 10, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus said, I came that they might, might have life and have it abundantly. I want you to go with me to the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is a beautiful book. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, and I'm going to read from verse 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, and I'm going to read from verse 9. I just love this book. It is a book that they say was written by the wisest man who ever lived. What was his name? That's right. His name was Solomon. But Solomon didn't go through with it, did he? At the end of his life, unfortunately, he fell. But this is what he wrote. He says, two are better than one. I'm talking now about marriage. I'm talking about choices. Two are better than one. Because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. And I've seen that so many times. It's so sad. Has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. The third cord is the Lord Jesus Christ. So you've got the husband, you've got the wife, and you've got the Lord Jesus Christ in the middle. And I'm telling you, young people, this is a word for those young married couples. If Jesus Christ is the prominent person in your home, you have got a guaranteed marriage for as long as you live. And I really mean that. In fact, I feel so strongly about that, that if a couple come to me and ask me to marry them, and they are not believers, I will not do it. 
because the chances of that marriage succeeding are very, very slim. Why? Because you've got two people, one from a, a different walk of life, a, a different personalities, different characters, different tastes, and they've got to come together. Okay, and what brings them together? Only the love of Christ. Only the Lord Jesus Christ, because they make choices. And I want to say to the young couple, don't, do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Jill and I don't go to sleep unless we say sorry. Oh, by the way, you thought we had a perfect marriage. No, we haven't got a perfect marriage. We are human beings. Do you ever have an argument? Not really an argument, lots of disagreements. <laughs> and how do, how do we overcome them? By what does Jesus say? And also to be prepared to say sorry. So important. Yeah, but it wasn't my fault. It doesn't matter. You've offended your spouse. Just say sorry. Don't try and justify yourself every time. Just say sorry. You know that story I've told you a lot of times. Billy Graham is one of my heroes. He's a man that went the full distance. He didn't fall down. He went the whole way. What an incredible man. But he had an incredible wife. And we forget that. And her name was Ruth. And they asked Ruth, and she was also very honest. I asked her one day, did you ever think about divorcing Billy? She said, divorce? Never. Murder? Often. <laughs> but you know, Jesus puts us together. And we've got to make a choice. See, when, when you got married, you said in front of the minister, in front of all your, all your guests, you said, until death do us part. Didn't you say that? Well, that's what you meant. And that's what it means. You see, you're making a covenant with each other, but you're also making a covenant with God. And that's what we forget. It disturbs me when I hear the, of the amount of divorces in the faith. Now, I want to say to you now, I know some of you are watching this program and you say, but Angus, are we disqualified? Because we are divorced, but we've, uh, we've repented. We've asked God to forgive us. And now we're carrying on with our lives. I say, that's fine. There's no degree of sin. Sin is sin. It's like theft. If you steal $1 or a $1 million, you're still a thief. Now, if you say sorry, and you genuinely repent, and you promise never to do it again, then that's okay. It is. You can't say that God will forgive some sins and not others. No, he died. He said, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You'll find that in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. And in Romans chapter 6 verse 23, the Lord says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And that's where eternal life comes from. And once you've done that, there's no more condemnation. Romans chapter 8 verse 1, I know what I'm speaking about. God has forgiven me for many things. As long as I repent, what does that mean? It means stop doing it, turn the other way, or walk the other way. And I tell you what, that choice will change your life. It'll make you fall in love with your spouse all over again. Be kind to each other. That's what Jill always says to me. She says, Angus, I wish people would be more kind to each other. Just be kind. What does it cost to say a word of encouragement? What does it cost? Nothing. Be kind to each other. Don't be angry. There's enough anger out there. Be patient and long-suffering. Who gives you that? Those are the fruits of the Spirit that come from the Holy Spirit that lives within you. That's what people are desperate to see. The family that prays together, stays together. Every morning when I wake up, first thing I do, I turn over and I say to my wife, Jill, I love you. That's the first thing. And then we pray. We pray for our family, our loved ones. We pray for the government. We pray for the problems in the world. And then I get up and I go and make her a nice cup of tea. And then I go through to my quiet time room and I spend time with the Lord. It's a choice. I do it whether I feel like it or whether I don't feel like it. And I've been doing it for so long now, I cannot do anything else. Take, take Take everything that this world has to offer and put it to one side and rather take Jesus because He's the one who changes us. 
You see, he never changes, but he changes us. Take time to sit down and speak to the Lord. Tell him that you love him. And tell your family that you love them. More importantly, and even as we hear that aeroplane flying overhead, it's flying from Durban to Johannesburg. There are people in that aeroplane, and they also need the Lord Jesus Christ. And many a time when I'm flying, a pilot will come through, send the air hostess through, call me into the cockpit, and we have a time of prayer together. It's a great honor. He puts me in the jump seat in the middle. And what do we talk about? We talk about choices. We talk about choices. What, what choice do you need to make? I want to pray with you. Maybe you have never, ever accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. That's right. Maybe you've been to church all your life, but you have never actually prayed the sinner's prayer. I was in a major church in Durban many years ago, and I was speaking to church pastors from different denominations. I think there might have been maybe a thousand of them there. And the Holy Spirit laid upon my heart, ask them if they are born again. I'm saying to the Lord, I'm having a private conversation with the Lord while I'm preaching. I do that from time to time. I'm saying, Lord, is this a joke? These are shepherds. These are men that are leading congregations. Some of them big congregations. I'm a farmer. He said, ask them. I tell you what, I got the shock of my life. I said, if you've never made a public commitment of your life, stand up now. You cannot believe how many stood up. I want to pray for you now as well. Please bow your head. And maybe you have, and you've walked off into the far country. Well, the Lord says, today you need to come back home. And then write to me and tell me what you've done, because I really would like to pray for you. Pray this prayer after me. Dear Lord Jesus, today I make a choice. And my choice is to follow you at all costs. And not just me, Lord, but my whole household. Lord, please forgive me. I used to pray with my staff on the farm, in the factory, on the mines, in the shops. But I don't do it anymore, Lord. I am sorry. Please forgive me. I make a choice today to do it again while there's still time left. Lord, I thank you for courage, for boldness, and most of all, for love for people. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, that today, as I've made this decision, I will put you first and foremost in my life. And I ask this in your precious name. Amen. Well, there we have it. You've prayed the prayer. Now go out and tell three people what you've just done. And I will see you again. And remember, you've just made the best choice of your life. Goodbye.